Welcome to part 11 of this week's online lecture. In part 11, we will continue our discussion of polyatomic molecules. In particular, now that we know how to classify them, what will their rotational spectra look like? Let's start with linear polyatomic molecules. In fact, we have already solved the rotational problem for linear systems. The solution is the same as for the diatomics. It doesn't matter how many atoms you have in a line, the rotational spectrum will look the same. The characteristics of this type of molecule in terms of their moments of inertia are identical. One of the moments of inertia is zero and the other two are the same. This means that the rotational energy levels for a linear polyatomic system is going to be identical to the diatomic molecules. We solved the Schrodinger equation for a linear system. We did this for diatomic, but the answer would have been the same for any linear system. And so, if we ignore centrifugal distortion, then the rotational term, energy, will be given by this familiar expression where I've written it down in terms of the rotational constant in wave numbers, and the rotational constant, as you can see, is inversely proportional to the moment of inertia. Now this moment of inertia here is associated with the B and C axes, which of course are the same. You can't distinguish between them. The difference though between say a triatomic linear molecule and a diatomic linear molecule is that the triatomic molecules are larger. This means that their moments of inertia are going to be greater. Remember the moment of inertia is just the sum of the masses times the distance from the center of mass squared. The more atoms you have in a line, the greater will be your moment of inertia. But what does this mean? If our moment of inertia is larger, it means that my rotational constant is going to be smaller. And remember, the spectral lines are approximately 2b apart. That means that the spectral lines for polyatomic systems are going to be much closer together than they were for the diatomic system and we can rationalize that in exactly the same way as we did for the diatomic systems when we were talking about the effect of centrifugal distortion. Because the spacing of the energy levels is related to the size of the molecule, this is exactly the same as when we discussed the part from the box system. The larger the box, the closer the energy levels. In this system, the rotational wave function can spread over a much larger region and so the energies are going to be smaller and the energy levels are going to be closer together. Let's have a look at a triatomic system. And this is rather an interesting one. This is OCS or carbonyl sulfide. So this molecule has an oxygen atom, a carbon atom and a sulfur atom all in a line. The sulfur atom is of course a lot heavier than the carbon and oxygen atoms and so the center of mass will lie somewhere along the CS bond and we can define therefore the distance the carbon atom is away from the center of mass as r sub c, the distance the oxygen atom is away from the center of mass as r sub o, and the distance the sulfur atom is away from the center of mass as r sub s. We've got a condition that enables us to identify the center of mass. If we take the product of the mass of the oxygen and the distance it is away from the center of mass and sum that to the mass of the carbon times the distance the carbon is away from the center of mass it will equal the mass of the sulfur times the distance it is away from the center of mass according to this equation here. Of course in terms of saying something about the structure of the molecule, we are not really interested in what the distances are away from the center of mass. We want to know what the bond lengths are. We want to know what the CS bond length is. But of course, we can define those in terms of these distances. Notice that the CO bond length is just the RO length minus the RC distance. And the CS bond length is just the RS plus the RC distances. We can calculate the moment of inertia around the center of mass through which the rotational axis will be going in exactly the same way as we did for the diatomic system. So it is just the mass of the oxygen times the RO distance squared 
plus the mass of the carbon times the RC distance squared plus the mass of the sulphur times the RS distance squared. We can then use these constraints on our system this one associated with the moments around the centre of mass and this enables us to transform the distances from the centre of mass to bond lengths and we can convert this equation into this one down here. That conversion is a little bit tedious and I will never ask you to do that. What about the bond lengths of OCS then? Can we determine the CO bond length and the CS bond length from a calculation of the rotational constant B? Well, yes, we can. If we only had the value of B for this isotopic mixture of OCS, we couldn't do it. This oxygen 16 carbon 12 sulfur 32 molecule has a rotational constant of 0.202864 wave numbers. But the moment of inertia has two unknowns in it, the two bond lengths. So we can't solve the system from one value of the rotational constant B. We need two values of the rotational constant B. Well, we can get a second value of the rotational constant B for this system, where we have substituted the sulphur atom here for sulphur 34. Because it has a different mass, and it will therefore have a different moment of inertia, and so a different value of the rotational constant B. But the thing that we know is that the bond length, that is the structure of the molecule itself, won't be different. The bond lengths do not depend on the masses of the atoms in just the same way as we discussed with diatomics. If we get a second rotational constant, we'll have two rotational constants. So we can set up two equations in which we have two unknowns and we can solve them simultaneously. In this particular problem, it is not very easy. But if you do that, you would come up with these two values of the bond length. So the CO bond length is shorter, as you would imagine, from the CS bond length. Let's now have a look at our spherical top molecules. We of course have this condition that the moment of inertia around the A axis is the same as the moment of inertia around the B axis, which is the same as around the C axis. The moment of inertia is independent of the choice of axes. The other thing that we know about a spherical top molecule is that there is no permanent dipole moment in a spherical top. Symmetry tells us this. So it doesn't have a microwave spectrum. So in essence we don't have to worry about this type of molecule. But just as we discussed for homonuclear diatomics, it doesn't mean that the molecule doesn't possess rotational levels. It has rotational levels, and indeed it can change its rotational energy through collisions, for instance. It cannot change its rotational levels through interaction with light. Or can it? Here is a spectrum for silicon tetrahydride, SiH4. This is the rotational spectrum. These numbers, these intensities, are incredibly small, but this is unambiguously a rotational spectrum for a symmetric top molecule. One of the things you want to notice about this spectrum is the size of the J value. The spectral line with maximum intensity is for the transition from J equals 15 to J equals 16. And as we go to lower values of J, the intensities are dropping off. So the question is how on earth can we see a rotational spectrum of silicon tetrahydride when it doesn't have a permanent dipole moment? How was this possible? Well, we can appreciate it in terms of symmetry again. We can understand what is going on. If we increase the rotational energy of the system, as we go to higher and higher rotational energy levels, the J becomes larger and larger, the molecule is rotating faster and faster. Centrifugal distortion is going to modify the shape of this molecule. If we rotate around the C3 axis, we can imagine that the off-axis hydrogen atoms will rise ever so slightly towards the horizontal plane through the silicon atom this will be a tiny effect. Look at the conditions that had to be used in order to see that spectrum. The path length was over 10 meters. The
pressure was over four atmospheres, and they also had to do it with a Michelson interferometer. But it arises because of centrifugal distortion as you rotate faster and faster. The atoms start to rise, so you can see a weak microwave spectrum. It is possible for tetrahedral molecules. You wouldn't, however, have seen it for an octahedral molecule. If you rotate around the C4 axis faster and faster, it still won't generate a dipole moment, but it will for a tetrahedral molecule like methane or sulfur hexafluoride. This is the end of part 11 of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part 12.